Section 15 of Oscar Wilde, Art and Morality, A Defence of the Picture of Dorian Gray, edited by Stuart Mason. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Martin Giessen. Section 15. The Romance of the Impossible by Julian Hawthorne. Footnote, Libincott's Monthly Magazine, September 1890. Fiction, which flies at all game, has latterly taken to the impossible as its quarry. The pursuit is interesting and edifying, if one goes properly equipped and with adequate skill. But if due care is not exercised, the impossible turns upon the hunter and grinds him to powder. It is a very dangerous and treacherous kind of wild fowl. The conditions of its existence, if existence can be predicated of that which does not exist, are so peculiar and abstruse that only genius is really capable of taming it and leading it captive but the capture when it is made is so delightful and fascinating that every tyro would like to try one is reminded of the princess of the fairy tale who was to be won on certain preposterous terms and if the terms were not met the discomfited suitor lost his head many misguided or overweening youths perished at last the one succeeded failure in a romance of the impossible is apt to be a disastrous failure on the other hand success carries great rewards of course the idea is not a new one the writings of the alchemists are stories of the impossible the fashion has never been entirely extinct balzac wrote the peau de chagrin and probably this tale is as good a one as was ever written of that kind the possessor of the skin may have everything he wishes for but each wish causes the skin to shrink and when it is all gone the wisher is annihilated with it by the art of the writer this impossible thing is made to appear quite feasible by touching the chords of coincidence and fatality the reader's common sense is soothed to sleep we feel that all this might be and yet no natural law be violated and yet we know that such a thing never was and never will be but the vitality of the story as of all good stories of the sort is due to the fact that it is the symbol of a spiritual verity the life of indulgence the selfish life destroys the soul this psychic truth is so deeply felt that its sensible embodiment is rendered plausible in the case of another famous romance frankenstein the technical art is entirely wanting a worse story from the literary point of view has seldom been written but the soul of it so to speak is so potent and obvious that although no one actually reads the book nowadays everybody knows the gist of the idea frankenstein has entered into the language for it utters a perpetual truth of human nature at the present moment the most conspicuous success in the line we are considering is stevenson's dr jekyll and mr hyde the author's literary skill in that awful little parable is at its best and makes the most of every point to my thinking it is an artistic mistake to describe hyde's transformation as actually taking place in plain sight of the audience the sense of spiritual mystery is thereby lost 
and a mere brute miracle takes its place but the tale is strong enough to carry this imperfection and the moral significance of it is so catholic it so comes home to every soul that considers it that it has already made an ineffaceable impression on the public mind every man is his own jekyll and hyde only without the magic powder on the bookshelf of the impossible mr stevenson's book may take its place beside balzac's mr oscar wilde the apostle of beauty has in the july number of lippincott's magazine a novel or romance it partakes of the qualities of both which everybody will want to read it is a story strange in conception strong in interest and fitted with a tragic and ghastly climax like many stories of its class it is open to more than one interpretation and there are doubtless critics who will deny that it has any meaning at all it is at all events a salutary departure from the ordinary english novel with the hero and heroine of different social stations the predatory black sheep the curate the settlements and society mr wilde as we all know is a gentleman of an original and audacious turn of mind and the commonplace is scarcely possible to him besides his advocacy of novel ideas in life art dress and demeanour had led us to expect surprising things from him and in this literary age it is agreed that a man may best show the best there is in him by writing a book those who read mr wilde's story in the hope of finding in it some compact and final statement of his theories of life and manners will be satisfied in some respects and dissatisfied in others but not many will deny that the book is a remarkable one and would attract attention even had it appeared without the author's name on the title page the picture of dorian gray begins to show its quality in the opening pages mr wilde's writing has what is called colour the quality that forms the mainstay of many of weeder's works and it appears in the sensuous descriptions of nature and of the decorations and environments of the artistic life the general aspect of the characters and the tenor of their conversation remind one a little of vivian gray and a little of pelham but the resemblance does not go far mr wilde's objects and philosophy are different from those of either disraeli or buller meanwhile his talent for aphorisms and epigrams may fairly be compared with theirs some of his clever sayings are more than clever they show real insight and a comprehensive grasp their wit is generally cynical but they are put into the mouth of one of the characters lord harry and mr wilde himself refrains from definitely committing himself to them though one cannot help suspecting that mr wilde regards lord harry as being an uncommonly able fellow be that as it may lord harry plays the part of old harry in the story and lives to witness the destruction of every other person in it he may be taken as an imaginative type of all that is most evil and most refined in modern civilization a charming gentle witty euphemistic mephistopheles who deprecates the vulgarity of goodness and muses aloud about those renunciations that men have unwisely called virtue 
and those natural rebellions that wise men still call sin upon the whole lord harry is the most ably portrayed character in the book though not the most original in conception dorian gray himself is as nearly a new idea in fiction as one has nowadays a right to expect if he had been adequately realised and worked out mr wilde's first novel would have been remembered after more meritorious ones were forgotten but even as nemo repente fuit turpissimus so no one or hardly any one creates a thoroughly original figure at a first essay dorian never quite solidifies in fact his portrait is rather the more real thing of the two but this needs explanation the story consists of a strong and marvellous central idea illustrated by three characters all men there are a few women in the background but they are only mentioned they never appear to speak for themselves there is too a valet who brings in his master's breakfasts and a chemist who by some scientific miracle disposes of a human body but substantially the book is taken up with the artist who paints the portrait with his friend lord harry aforesaid and with dorian gray who might so far as the story goes stand alone he and his portrait are one and their union points the moral of the tale the situation is as follows dorian gray is a youth of extraordinary physical beauty and grace and pure and innocent of soul an artist sees him and falls aesthetically in love with him and finds in him a new inspiration in his art both direct and general in the lines of his form and features and in his colouring and movement are revealed fresh and profound laws he paints him in all guises and combinations and it is seen and admitted on all sides that he has never before painted so well at length he concentrates all his knowledge and power in a final portrait which has the vividness and grace of life itself and considering how much both of the sitter and of the painter is embodied in it might almost be said to live the portrait is declared by lord harry to be the greatest work of modern art and he himself thinks so well of it that he resolves never to exhibit it even as he would shrink from exposing to public gaze the privacies of his own nature on the day of the last sitting a singular incident occurs lord harry meeting with dorian gray for the first time is no less impressed than was hallward the artist with the youth's radiant beauty and freshness but whereas hallward would keep dorian unspotted from the world and would have him resist evil temptations and all the allurements of corruption lord harry on the contrary with a truly satanic ingenuity discourses to the young man on the matchless delights and privileges of youth youth is the golden period of life youth comes never again in youth only are the senses endowed with divine potency only then are joys exquisite and pleasures unalloyed let it therefore be indulged without stint let no harsh and cowardly restraints be placed upon its glorious impulses men are virtuous through fear and selfishness 
they are too dull or too timid to take advantage of the godlike gifts that are showered upon them in the morning of existence and before they can realize the folly of their self-denial the morning has passed and weary day is upon them and the shadows of night are near but let dorian who is matchless in the vigour and resources of his beauty rise above the base shrinking from life that calls itself goodness let him accept and welcome every natural impulse of his nature the tragedy of old age is not that one is old but that one is young let him so live that when old age comes he shall at least have the satisfaction of knowing that no opportunity of pleasure and indulgence has escaped untasted this seductive sermon profoundly affects the innocent dorian and he looks at life and himself with new eyes he realises the value as well as the transitoriness of that youth and beauty which hitherto he had accepted as a matter of course and as a permanent possession gazing on his portrait he laments that it possesses the immortality of loveliness and comeliness that is denied to him and in a sort of imaginative despair he utters a wild prayer that to the portrait and not to himself may come the feebleness and hideousness of old age that whatever sins he may commit to whatever indulgences he may surrender himself not upon him but upon the portrait may the penalties and disfigurements fall such is dorian's prayer and though at first he suspects it not his prayer is granted from that hour the evil of his life is registered upon the face and form of his pictured presentment while he himself goes unscathed day by day each fresh sin that he commits stamps its mark of degradation upon the painted image cruelty sensuality treachery all nameless crimes corrupt and render hideous the effigy on the canvas he sees in it the gradual pollution and ruin of his soul while his own fleshly features preserve unstained all the freshness and virginity of his sinless youth the contrast at first alarms and horrifies him but at length he becomes accustomed to it and finds a sinister delight in watching the progress of the awful change he locks up the portrait in a secret chamber and constantly retires thither to ponder over the ghastly miracle no one but he knows or suspects the incredible truth and he guards like a murder secret this visible revelation of the difference between what he is and what he seems this is a powerful situation and the reader may be left to discover for himself how mr wilde works it out End of section 15